Throughout its history, humanity has made numerous great discoveries. From the invention of the wheel to the harnessing of atomic energy, humanity paved its way to the stars, claiming its place in the galaxy, and the discovery of the immaterium was one of the greatest achievements, its significance rivaling that of the invention of gunpowder. However, along with great opportunities, the warp also brings great danger. This mysterious space where the laws of the material universe do not apply turned out to be inhabited. Mighty entities, born from the emotions of sentient beings, turned their attention to the real world, seeking to distort it according to their unfathomable and ever-changing goals. Psychers seduced by the power of the warp go mad. Traitor Astartes unleash hell on Imperial worlds. Entire races fall into madness, paving the way for destructive forces, plunging planets and segments of space into the madness of warp storms. Those worlds that came under the power of chaos are subsequently called demonic. Each of these worlds is unique and any attempt to classify them is doomed to failure due to their complete senselessness. Where the boundary between reality and the immaterium blurs, so do the laws of the universe. Our familiar concepts of time and space lose all meaning, making demonic worlds capable of assuming the most impossible forms. A planet made entirely of glass, where time moves backward, and a single step can take you to the opposite hemisphere, is not unthinkable for the ruinous powers. Naturally, life as we know it is out of the question on such worlds, at least in the usual sense of the word. After all, it's difficult to live where the atmosphere is an impossible mixture of the most unexpected substances. However, there are inhabited planets among the demonic worlds, controlled by the traitor primarchs, the Dark Mechanicum, or demon princes eager for control over mortals. The population of such worlds usually consists of captured subjects of the Emperor and their descendants, in cases where they are allowed to reproduce. It is precisely these captives who form the core labor force in the Hellforges, demonic worlds under the control of the Dark Mechanicum. Free from the dogmas of the cult Mechanicus, these tech priests are capable of the most unimaginable sacrileges against machinery. Following their inflamed imagination, they harness the power of the Immaterium, creating terrible abominations, possessed machines covered in demonic flesh, as well as twisted artifacts of the Dark Age of Technology. All this requires monstrous production power and a vast amount of labor. Traitor Space Marine warbands gather captives throughout the Imperium and transfer them to the Hellforges in exchange for ammunition and equipment. At first glance, life on a Hellforge is not much different from life on a regular planet of tech priests. However, while the followers of the Omnissia maintain some semblance of humanity, the Dark Mechanicum is freed from this inconvenience. Endless work shifts can turn at any moment into participation in one of the countless cybernetization experiments. A person can become a victim of a ritual to summon a demon, which will be trapped in the next defiler, not to mention extraordinary incidents when possessed mechanisms go into a frenzy. Worlds under the rule of the traitor Primarchs also deserve no less attention. Serving as a home for the rebellious Astartes for millennia, these planets have absorbed the very essence of the legions. The infamous Eliatada, or Plague Planet, under the rule of Primarch Mortarion, has turned into a twisted likeness of Barbarus, where the Death Guard space marines have taken the place of the lords who once oppressed them atop the mountains. Now here, mountains rose. They were not natural. Their glossy slopes, made slippery by slimes, were too steep and dark to have been formed by tectonic shifts or erosion. For 10,000 years, they have risen higher and higher into the sky, until the entire surface of the planet came to resemble a porcupine's hide, with valleys glowing bright green fire and peaks as black as the souls of their creators. Every inch of the land below was riddled with tunnels and teemed with an impossibly large crowd. Once they were human, now split into many subspecies. They pushed through the toxic thickets, carrying materials to build new mountains, supported only by unwavering faith and the raw flesh of the dead. They breathed the infected air, causing them to mutate even further, and walk the ancient roads with heavy burdens on their backs. 
Perturabo and the Iron Warriors captured the planet of Medrangard, turning it into a fortress world strewn with fortifications, factories and slave pits. As with the Dark Mechanicus, the Fourth Legion receives millions of slaves from across the Imperium who are doomed to work under the dead sky and black sun for the purpose of building ever more sophisticated fortifications and producing ever more deadly destructive mechanisms. Not least known is Sycorus, a world that has given shelter to the Primarch of the Word Bearers. Endless temples and cathedrals devoted to the ruinous powers are hidden under a sky the colour of fire and blood. Tens of millions of slaves toil to erect new buildings and maintain old ones. The space for new temples on the surface has long run out and now they pile up on top of each other and delve deep underground, turning the planet into a labyrinth of corridors and tunnels. It is there that the Templum Inficio is located, where the Primarch himself has been meditating for 10,000 years, studying the nature of the Immaterium, following the will of the ruinous powers. The Sons of Magnus have also found their home. Sortiarius, a rocky planet with active volcanoes, covered by leaden skies trembling from the eruptions of magical energy, the planet of the Sorcerers has also absorbed the essence of the Legion settled on it. However, little on its surface could remind one of the greatness of Prospero. The world of the Thousand Suns does not suffer from overpopulation. Few of its inhabitants take refuge in their towers, including the Primarch, who almost never leaves the Cyclops Tower. Even when tainted by chaos, the human mind seeks order. Demonic worlds under the rule of traitors, though hardly hospitable, do provide a more than possible and in some ways even familiar life for the ordinary Imperial subject. However, demons are not burdened by the limitations imposed by reality, and under their rule, Demonic worlds may take the most unimaginable forms. Take, for instance, the world of Oliensis, where an entire space marine chapter met its end on its surface. The uneven, leathery surface of the planet was covered with blisters, fat folds the size of continents, and forests of hairy trees. Overwhelmed by all the abomination taking place, the space marines began exterminating the goat-legged degenerates, frolicking and mating in the leathery growths. When the pain of the planet's inhabitants sent a shiver across it, warriors of chaos in screamingly colourful armour began to rain down on the loyalists from the sweaty pores. These were the noise marines of Slanesh. The Astartes took a defensive stance and stubbornly fought off the cries and howls of sonic weapons. But new enemies took the place of the slain, ejected by the planet. Soon, Oliensis opened its blurred eyes, and with a twitch of its repulsive limb, swept all the carnage into the bottomless abyss of its belly. The planet took the form of a huge living human, with one movement of its hand capable of engulfing an entire order of Astartes. Or consider the world hidden deep within the screaming vortex, ironically named Contrition. This place exists in the form of a demonic city whose structure constantly collapses and is rebuilt as each of the Dark Gods gains and loses power. It is said that in the City of Contrition, demons adjudicate, whispering to mortals the most exquisite lies they concoct. According to tales, a cacophony of lies from the people of other worlds spreads throughout the demonic capital, and the demons constantly compete with each other in devising even more absurd plans to ensnare the souls of humanity. It is said that mortals who fall for demonic trickery are dragged into contrition to be imprisoned in dungeons deep within its belly. Even the most warp-touched heretic cannot imagine the fate awaiting such captive souls in the grim underground dungeons. Like any warp storm, the Screaming Vortex contains within it numerous worlds twisted by the influences of the Immaterium. And on some of them, against all odds, remnants of civilization still remain. The planet Melancholia is perpetually tormented by fierce hail and torrential rains. It seems that its inhabitants exist in eternal suffering. A cruel whim of the warp's inhabitants forces them to live without even the most basic necessities. By some unnatural law on Melancholia, it's impossible to place one stone upon another so its population will never get a respite from the fierce freezing winds that assail them every minute of their miserable lives. Despite appearances suggesting otherwise, the inhabitants of Melancholia Harbour desires that would even make the most shameless follower of the Dark Prince blush. Internally, they seethe with lust and a thirst for bloodshed. However, 
Their environment constantly dampens this passion, turning their lives into a cold existence of suffering and trials. It is said that to take someone from melancholia and transport them elsewhere is to unleash the beast they have nurtured in their heart their entire life. Such individuals become the most cruel, bloodthirsty and blasphemous champions of the ruinous powers in all of existence. The world of Aphexis also deserves mention, a dreary realm of grey, semi-dead plains. Its sky knows neither day nor night, and the star around which it orbits never properly rises above the horizon, no matter where an observer might find themselves on its surface. Aphexis is densely populated by beings as sombre as their world. Outwardly devoid of individual character and will, the people of Aphexis lead a half-life, wandering the ashen plains of their planet and barely interacting with one another. Many warlords have tried to impose their will upon bleak Aphexis. However, their efforts seldom paid off. It often happened that people were driven into slavery, forced to labour or fight in the name of new, ruthless masters. It seems that the inhabitants of Aphexis silently accept such twists of fate and care so little for their own lives that they soon incur the wrath of their overseers. Those who have enslaved Aphexians often resort to killing thousands of them in an attempt to make an example that would drive the rest to work harder. Yet, they always find such methods utterly ineffective. Equally interesting is the world named Furia, a realm of black skies over even blacker bottomless oceans. The unusually calm waters are inhabited by creatures that most consider a vile hybrid of beasts and demons. The population clings to life on dilapidated floating boat huts made from the remains of spacecraft. The hellish skies of Furia impassively watch over the perfect sphere of dark waters, floating amidst the raging madness of the screaming vortex. No one knows how deep the planetary waters extend. Attempts to reach the bottom have been made over the centuries, all ending in failure, leading many inhabitants of Fury to believe that the global ocean is simply boundless. Stories are often told of a starship that crashed and sank, but its surviving distress beacon continued to send a signal for years, growing weaker over time. According to its last transmission, the ship had sunk so deep into the bottomless abyss that it would have emerged on the other side of the planet, had it not failed to even approach the bottom. The inhabitants of Furia, like on the edge of a knife, exist on the brink of oblivion, fighting for survival against the horrific leviathan demons that without warning rise from the calm, glass-like seas and drag entire floating cities to their doom. Thousands of tentacles covered in suckers rise from the water while sharp diamond-like beaks bite and tear. Only those among the floating communities who have managed to find and bring long-range weapons into working order have a chance of surviving such an attack. They use rusty heavy stabbers and lascanons to keep the creatures at bay for at least one more day. The concept of surprise is meaningless in relation to demonic worlds. After all, when there are no limits, it is foolish to be surprised by the impossible. Yet even under such circumstances, chaos can still surprise. Magog, a former Imperial Agriworld in the Segmentum Ultima, under the influence of the Immaterium, it has turned into a distorted parody of itself. Rivers that once supplied water to settlements and fields are now filled with blood, and plants have mutated into predators, often devouring those who tend to them. The planet's landscape is more unstable, and mountains that towered in the east yesterday can suddenly sink into the ground, only to appear in the north the next day. However, despite all the changes, the planet continues to serve its new masters. The distortions have not only failed to kill the cultivated crops, but have also greatly increased their yield. Millions of tons of produce leave the planet annually to feed the traitor space marines and their slaves. A fully functional agri-world serving the heretics is a very rare occurrence, making Magog one of the most protected planets under the control of the ruinous powers. Numerous orbital defense platforms, constantly present ships, and according to rumours, a Blackstone Fortress protect the demonic world from any threats from space. For obvious reasons, the Eye of Terror is a true concentration of demonic worlds, many of which simply cannot exist in the real world. However, even there, the Orcs managed to reach at the beginning of the 42nd millennium. The infamous Tusker Demon Killer led his war into the Eye of Terror, 
knowing that there he could find a fight impossible to find anywhere else. The orcs visited worlds of sparkling crystals, forbidden paradisiacal gardens, jungles of murmuring corpses, and large crackling spheres of pure energy. Each new world was stranger than the last. The orcs saw things that would have driven men mad. On a planet carpeted with gangrenous gargoyles, writhing and gaping their maws under the orcs' feet, piercing them with their moist tongues, Tusker and his boys grabbed their choppers and hacked at everything that moved. On a planet made of living silk, long-legged temptresses attempted to bewitch the orc warriors marching through their weightless palaces. Demonesses met the blades of orc choppers and walls of leaden fire. On a planet cut from diamond shaped by thought itself, the orcs with iron boots and horned helmets carved their way through sparkling labyrinths. Impossible buildings were destroyed, semi-real relics were trampled, and chaos-worshipping singers were chopped down. This continued until the orcs found themselves on a planet whose surface was completely covered in blood and spewed forth an endless stream of demons. Tusker and his green-skinned brethren engaged in battle with the spawn of corn and continued to fight until the last orc fell dead surrounded by mountains of his brethren's corpses. However, Tusker's story did not end there. With each new dawn on the bloody world, Tusker and his orcs found themselves whole and unharmed. They fought again and again in the bloody marshes, becoming eternal puppets of the blood god, caught in an endless cycle of war and death. Life for a human on a demonic world is hardly describable due to the fact that these worlds are mostly not so much planets as they are constantly changing impossible phenomena, with life on them taking the most unimaginable and distorted forms, if it can exist there at all.